Now, for unit two, more possibly for unit one, depends on where you would like to do this, here is a little enrichment topic that you might find interesting. I call it algebra for science. It's the notion of variation. So let's talk about what that might be. In science, of course, any of the sciences, physics, chemistry, etc., you are talking about various quantities in algebraic expressions. So let's let, say, x and y be any two quantities. And these could represent all sorts of things in physics, for example, and I'll show you some of those. Let x and y be any two quantities, and let's take a real number k, k in the real numbers, and make sure that it is a non-zero real number. OK, I'm going to define now various sorts of variations. We'll start with first one, a, part a, I'll call direct variation. Now this is terminology that is used in the sciences. It's not particularly a mathematical topic in that the terminology is really uh, what's important here. The mathematics is fairly simple, as you'll see. Direct variation. We say the following. Here are the phrases that are used. We say y varies directly. y is one of the quantities. y varies directly with x. We say it that way, or we say that y is directly proportional, directly proportional to x. So there's another phrase. If what happens? If y is a multiple of x, so y equals kx. Now, of course, you know what this is as far as a graph goes. It's simply a line. And since there's no intercept indicated here, this is a line that passes through the origin. Now, a piece of terminology, either k is referred to as the constant of proportionality. The constant of proportionality. And that will change in various sorts of formulas, of course. Proportionality. There is an older symbol for this, by the way. This is the mathematically correct way to write this. There is an older way that this is written, and I'll put it down here. The older way is to say that y is proportional to x, with that funny little symbol there. And that's no longer used because we've adopted the equal sign, and this is far more easy to work with. But you'll see this very often used by folks in the sciences when they first want to say that something is directly proportional. They'll write this, and then they'll immediately go to the equation form. So that's what direct proportionality or direct variation is. One variable is simply a multiple of the other one. OK, here is the second definition, definition part B. And this is inverse variation. Inverse variation. Now you probably can guess where this is going to go, but let me write it out. Inverse variation. Here is the phrasing that we use here. We say y varies inversely, inversely with x, as opposed to directly with x. y varies inversely with x, or we say y is inversely proportional to x. Proportional to x. There we go. If what? Well, if y is equal to k over x. So the x is now in the denominator instead of being on the top. So this is what inverse variation is. And of course, this is the constant of proportionality again. I'll even write it out, proportionality. OK, just as before, it's called the constant of proportionality. And the old symbol, OK, the older way of writing this is that y is proportional to 1 over x. That's the way you might see it sometimes. But the equation, of course, is far more useful. It brings in all the mathematics you know. You may also recognize from your experience, if you're doing this after unit 2, that this is the y equals 1 over x curve simply multiplied by a constant, so that the graph of this will be fairly easy to see. All right, before we talk about the third category of variation, let me show you some examples of these first two, the direct and the inverse variation. So here are some examples from the sciences. And first, let me talk about direct variation. 
For example, here's a formula, P equals KT. And this is true for constant volume, say V. Okay? This is pressure, and this is temperature T. And pressure is simply a multiple of the temperature. For example, think of a pressure cooker. In a pressure cooker, the volume does not change. If you increase the pressure, the temperature will go up. If you increase the temperature by putting it on a stove, for example, with the cover on, the pressure will go up. So this is a fact from physics. Here's another one from physics. F equals MA. This is famous because it is what's called Newton's second law. Second law of physics. And it means force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if the mass is constant, this becomes the constant here, and so force is proportional to acceleration, directly proportional. Here's another famous one, F equals K times, say, D. This is an example of what's called Hooke's Law. Now Hooke's Law is governs springs, and the F is the force required to stretch or compress a spring through a distance D. And this is the constant of proportionality, often called the spring constant here, and as the constant grows, the force grows higher. So thicker, bigger springs are harder to compress or stretch than smaller, finer ones. And so on. Okay, those are examples of direct variation. Here are some examples, two examples, say, of inverse variation. P is equal to K over V. And this is in the situation where we have constant temperature. Constant temperature, big T. Now these are the same variables as over here. Except now, if the volume increases, the pressure will go down, assuming constant temperature. So if you have a balloon that you've blown up, and then you blow it up to hundreds of times larger, it will not stay inflated because the pressure has gone down. The volume's gone up, the pressure's gone down, and vice versa. This is inverse variation. Here's another one that's a little bit more unusual. W equals K over L. And the situation here is that you have, and I'll draw it bent, a board. Okay? Imagine you have a board, say, made of, out of pine or something. And there is a weight that is put at the center of the board, and the board is supported at the end, say. And the L represents the length of the board. Now, if you think about this, as the weight increases, the board is going to bend more. And so, uh, depending on the length. If it's a short length board, it won't bend as much. If it's long, it will bend even more. So this weight is related to the length of the board this way. If the length increases, the weight goes down. Uh, and if the, if the length decreases, the weight goes up. So there is a relationship between those, and there's some interesting formulas from physics. Let's now go ahead and look at the case that is a combination of the previous cases. So it's sort of a, a grand collection category, sometimes called joint and combined variation. And this is really just an extra category where we don't really need any more than A and B. But if we put them together, we can get these sorts. So this is when you have more than just the two quantities. You might have three quantities or four, et cetera. There are three of these, and the first one I will call jointly, and this is the direct version of jointly. This is where y is equal to k, but instead of just being times a single x, it might be times x and x2 all the way up to xn. There may be several variables here instead of just the one. So y is directly in direct variation with all of the variables, not just the one. So that's direct variation jointly. Of course, once you have that, you can see that there might be a jointly inverse variation. And of course there is. That would be where y is equal to k over not just one variable, but possibly two or more. So this would be varying jointly inversely. And finally, there's the combined variation where you might have y equals k, I'll put it out front, times, well, there might be one or more variables on top. There could be just one. 
but there might be one or more, and x1 to xn will represent those, and then say z1, z2 up to zn will represent the bottom. So the top represents direct variation, the bottom represents inverse variation, and since they're both present, this is referred to as combined variation. Okay? And the x1, x2, xn, and the z's are all various quantities, and the k, as usual, is non-zero. So let me show you some examples of this. These become more interesting in physics and uh, chemistry, etc., because very often there are several quantities involved, not just two. The examples here, I'll just give you two. Volume is equal to K times temperature over pressure. This puts together all of the various uh, examples I had before for direct and inverse variation. This does not assume constant temperature or constant pressure or constant volume. These are the relationships between those two. Here's another one. L, this is a little bit more interesting for those that live in houses. L is equal to K times AT over little d. Now what do these represent? I'll go ahead and show you in this case. Uh, A, let me box that in there. A is equal to the area. So A is equal to the area of the wall. We're talking now about a wall of a house. A is the area of the wall. T is equal to the temperature difference between the inside of the wall and the outside of the wall, like the inside of your house in winter and the outside of the house. D is the thickness of the wall, thickness of the wall, and L, what you're computing there, is the loss of heat. And the constant of proportionality is determined by experiment. But here's a relationship that says if the, the, the loss of heat is some multiple of the area of the wall times the temperature difference divided by the thickness of the wall. So this is an interesting example where we have one, two, three, four quantities involved. And in physics, you'll see several sorts of things like this. Let's do a couple of examples here just to show you how one might work with these. Here's one I've written out for me, so I don't have to spend the time writing it for you. The volume V of a sphere varies directly with the cube of its radius. So it's not just the radius. This will often happen when you're talking about variation. Sometimes it won't be just the variable alone. It may be the cube or the second power or some other power of the variable. It varies directly with the cube of its radius, and the constant of proportionality is given to us to be 4 pi over 3. Well, that means volume is equal to constant of proportionality, 4 pi over 3, times, this is direct variation, r cubed, where r represents the radius. That's it. All I wanted to do was write down a direct variation, and now I've done so. Here's another one. These take a bit to write out. That's why I've written it out beforehand. Here we have the force F required to maintain an object in a circular path varies by experiment, experiment directly with its mass and the square of its speed V. And it varies inversely with the radius R of the circular path. And we're given that the constant of proportionality here is 1. So with that information, it's just a matter of writing this down. The force is equal to constant of proportionality 1 times direct variation with the mass and the velocity squared and inverse variation with r. And that's it. That's all that needs to be written down if you wanted to just uh, examine uh, direct variation and inverse variation here. All right, here is a final example in which we have to do a little bit more calculation. The weight W of a body above the surface of the Earth, like our bodies, for example, varies inversely with the square of its distance R from the center of the Earth. Now, let's suppose a given body weighs 55 pounds when it is 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth. Now, if that's true, how much will it weigh when it is 4,400 miles? 4,400 miles from the center. Okay? Why don't you go ahead and try that, and I'll come back in a moment and show you what I did.
Well, the first thing we should do in this is write down, in general, what we've learned from the statement about the relationship between the weight and that distance. So in general, we learned that the weight w is equal to some multiple over the distance squared. That's inverse variation with respect to the distance from the center of the Earth, r, squared. Now, in this problem, we are given that 55, when you have 55 pounds of weight, that's equal to k over 4,000 squared, because we are told 55 pounds at 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth. So from that, immediately we get that k is 55 times 4,000 squared. And of course, once again, I'm not going to do any multiplication. I don't have to do until the very end of the problem. So with k, then, I can write specifically Here I had the general form, but the k was unknown. Now I know what k is, I can write specifically what the formula is. So I now know that w is equal to specifically 55 times 4,000 squared over r squared. Now I can answer the question I was given. If r is equal to 4,400, if you are that many, uh, if you're that distance above the Earth, and that was measured in uh, miles, if you're that many miles above the Earth, then, using the formula, W is equal to 55 times 4,000 squared over 4,400 squared, putting the R in. And of course, if you put that in your calculator, you'll get 45.45 pounds, which is lighter than the original 55 pounds, which is what you expect as you move further and further away from the center of the Earth. So with that, we'll stop this small segment on variation, and we'll go on to another one.